in his pain and agony for every sin to hide shed the blood that stained the old rugged cross twas his blood his precious blood that stained the old rugged cross twas his love that paid the awful cause <clears throat> oh soul so far astray come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. What an awful death he died to pardon you and me. All alone in agony he tossed. And a world once lost in sin can now be holy free. By the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Twas his blood, his precious blood, that stained the old rugged cross. Twas his love that paid the awful cost. Oh, so, so far astray, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross and let's look over to page number 207 207 <clears throat> first and the last on this one <clears throat> there's a land that is fairer than day and by faith we can see it afar for the Father waits over the way <coughs> Prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore <coughs> In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And let's finish it out with page number 214. 214. We'll do the first and last on this one. <coughs> Soon we'll come to the end of life's journey And perhaps we'll never meet anymore Till we gather in heaven's bright city Far away on that beautiful shore If we never meet again this side of heaven as we struggle through this world and its strife, there's another meeting place somewhere in heaven by the side of the river of life where the charming roses bloom forever and where separations come no more. If we never meet again this side of heaven I will meet you on that beautiful shore oh they say we shall meet by the river where no storm clouds ever darken the sky and they say we'll be happy in heaven in the wonderful sweet by and by 
If we never meet again this side of heaven As we struggle through this world and its strife There's another meeting place somewhere in heaven By the side of the river of life Where the charming roses bloom forever and where separations come no more If we never meet again this side of heaven I will meet you on that beautiful shore Thank y'all I'm glad we can laugh and have a good time in church. <laughs> That's why I don't do music, Bill, right there. Just don't even mess with it. Well, thank you all for coming back. I know the weather's kind of nasty and cold. Well, what's going on? I guess it's Texas. But I'm going to... Like I started off last Sunday night, I told you I was going to share some of the things that I kind of jotted down uh, while I've been away, and I think I've got it narrowed down to about six things I want to talk about, and so tonight's number two. <laughs> um, I want to do uh, some more from the Psalms tonight. Uh, generally, that's what Christians do when you, you find yourself in a valley, you go to the Psalms because David has a lot to say there in times of trouble, and so do some other guys. Uh, so I just want to share some more about that, what we can gain from the Psalms. There's also many happy songs, so they're not all sad. Um, but then after that, uh, I want to look at some of the prophets with you. Uh, we'll definitely look at Job. Um, everybody's familiar with what Job is about. And let's kind of look at some things there too that are, that are very helpful. So what I'm going to do right now is, uh, like I said, this is just stuff that came uh, as I was praying and having my own contemplation, figuring things out, asking God what He was doing. And so I just, I just found things. And as I found things, I wrote those things down so I wouldn't forget them. And that's kind of what we have tonight. Psalm 88 is what I want to start with you uh, first off. Uh, this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. And some of your Bibles may have those titles and explanations above the psalm. Sometimes they may not, but uh, these were the, the worship leaders of the Jewish people. Um, and so when they would have worship, uh, the, the sons of Korah, uh, that group, would help lead. And so what you have here is a, is a song written down in a very difficult time for the, the Israelites by the music leaders. And uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we, I think I remember some... I remember singing some hymns that might talk about the troubles of life, but most of our hymns are uplifting or more happy or they concentrate on just God, you know, that kind of stuff. But there are quite a few songs that the Israelites sang in church 
in their worship services. And you're like, why in the world would you sing that? You're going to leave, you're weeping. But these are the, the Psalms are the song book of God. And these are the songs he gave his people as they were going through different things. And there are a lot of songs in here that talk about the reality that there's trouble in this life. And what's fascinating about Psalm 88 is even if you read some sad ones, you're going to at least get some happy stuff in them. Psalm 88 starts off with one verse of anything positive, the rest of it's all negative. And that's how the song ends. So we can sing that bill after the service is over. Let's all walk out of here feeling real negative. And uh, No, I'm just kidding. But I want to read this psalm for you because this is, this is again, this is the, the worship leaders. There's no happy ending. It's just, it's just very real. But there's one thing you can hold on to in it. So you can read along with me or I'll have it on the screen there and I'll do a better job of following along up there. So, O oh Lord God of my salvation, I've cried out day and night before You. Let my prayer come before You. Incline Your ear to my cry. For my soul is, in, is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. I'm counted with those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more and who are cut off from your hand. You've laid me in the lowest pit in darkness in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me and you've afflicted me with your waves. You've put away my acquaintances far from me. You've made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up and I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I've called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But to you I've cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I've been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me all together. Loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances in the darkness. And all God's people said, Amen, let's praise the Lord. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, it's not certain what was going on there, but there, there's, a, there's a belief that these, this particular person uh, was struggling with some kind of ongoing illness since youth. And it was something that was so bad, could have been leprosy based on how they describe things, where, you know, God, I'm afflicted with this thing, and, and I keep praying for it to go away, and, you know, you don't do anything about it. And all of my friends, all of my acquaintances, they're far from me. Well, that's typically how you'd treat a leper. Now, we don't know that for sure, but this sounds like a sick person and someone who's, who's pretty bad sick, and it's something that's just going to, you know, it's just going to keep going on. And it's not God's will, at least at that point into their adulthood, to take it away. And so they're kind of isolated. They're, they're sick all the time. They pray and pray, and nothing gets taken away. And so... If you've ever been there, maybe not necessarily sick like that, but if you've been in that valley where you, you ask all the same questions, uh, I ask a lot of those same questions. God, do you hear? God, are you there? God, you know, your, your word says you protect and take care and you keep us secure, but it sure don't feel like it right now. Why are you allowing all this? All these questions. You know, why, why are you quiet? Why don't you... Give me just one sign or one big booming answer so I know something's going on up there, you know. And, and you know, one thing that, that I was thinking about with all this is, you know, God wants us to call out to Him. And what I've come to, something I just wrote down, what I've come to learn during my time of trial is we learn most in the silence. Uh, our faith grows the strongest when God makes us wait a while. How many of you have been there before? And it doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So you think the longer God makes me wait, the weaker someone's faith is going to get. But if you're a true believer and the Spirit's in there, one, He's not going to allow you to, to drift off into lostness. You're not going to lose your salvation. 
He's going to complete the good work in you. But somehow that faith is sustained, even when you have absolutely zero answers. I found myself there, especially at the very beginning, for the first, man, the first at least three or four weeks. It was like God was saying nothing, and all I had was faith. And some encouraging words from some of you. This is something else that's real. When you start praying about this stuff, you know, eventually you have to be like the psalm writers and the people in the Bible. You're not going to get anywhere. You eventually got to be real about what's really going on. And that's just something else I wrote down here is that's actually the scariest place to be is when you're at the point where I have to say what's happening. I have to admit it to myself. I have to admit it to God. I have to tell my loved ones something's wrong and something's happening with me and it's not good. That's really scary to be in that place because you know, you and I both know, if you've been there, I can hide it inside as long, whatever I'm dealing with, I can hide it as long as I want and as long as I keep it between me and myself and I, it's not really a real problem yet. But as soon as I say it, as soon as I pray it, as soon as I let someone know, now it's real and now it's out there and now I've got to deal with it because it's out in the world now. And so that was something that I, I thought about here. The scariest thing in my experience with all this anxiety, depression stuff is the act of admitting that it's a real problem because as long as you keep quiet, it isn't real yet. Once you verbalize it and put it out there, it's real. And now that journey to battling with it really starts. And it's a scary place to be, but it's also the place where your healing starts. So whatever issues you ever face in life, it doesn't have to be what I've been facing, but whatever it is, you're going to have something. You've had something, and then you will have something. We've got to get it out there and be real with God. Like this song. Not one happy line in it, and that's okay. God doesn't need, need you to share your heart with Him and then sing kumbaya at the end so you don't hurt His feelings. Right? He, he knows exactly what's happening. He wants you to realize it. And then you to realize you need Him to get through it. That's hard. So all that to say, number one out of this entire psalm, you get your answer or what you really can do out of the very first line. <laughs> in life's valleys, when God seems silent, we must remind ourselves of salvation in Christ to sustain us. There were a few days like that where you know, I'd kind of gone out into nature and I was just me and God praying and I had no answers and there was no sign and there was no feeling and there was none of that. It was just me me and my, uh, my troubles. I'm praying to God. In a couple of days, that was all I had. Jesus is my Savior. And no matter what happens, at least I'm going to heaven. That's all I had. And in some weird way, that was enough. And that's all these guys had. Not necessarily that Jesus had come yet, but, but they knew. Verse 1, O Lord, God of my salvation. That's where they started. And then the rest of us just pouring their heart out of what's wrong and why, God, don't you do something about it. You can pray like that too. It's okay. It's in the Bible. Lesson number two. Oh, wait, no, I want to share this. I wrote this down. I don't want to take credit. Um, I heard a, a sermon on Daniel uh, from John MacArthur. It's an old one. And he, he said this, but he was, teach, he was preaching on the Daniel and the lion's den. You all know that story. He said, either way, whether God answers our prayers for help in times of trouble or the trouble takes our lives, Christians always win. Christians win no matter what. If Daniel died in the lion's den, he goes to heaven. He wins. If God spares his life and the lions do no harm to him, Daniel wins because he gets to continue living. Either way, God's people always win. So you ever find yourself in a valley like that? And you're a Christian, maybe that's all you have, but that's all you need. Is, I'm going to heaven. So whether God takes this from me or not, or whether this trial actually is the end of me, I'm okay. Lesson number two. Trials are good. Oh, don't you, isn't that where you start when a trial begins? Oh, this is great. No, 
you end up here, hopefully. Trials are good because they grow our faith in God and they increase our knowledge of His Word. Now that's, that's what should happen in the Christian's life. A lost person will not handle things this way. But if you're a believer, this is what should happen. And you won't do it perfectly. But when trials come along, you're going to realize they're good because they're going to grow your faith in God. And it should drive you to His Word or at least seek biblical counsel in what's happening. So you grow more in your faith. I'm going to go to Psalm 119 for this. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, and it just so happens to be a chapter about the supremacy and sufficiency of the Bible. It tells you why the Bible is enough. And so I'm going to read, I mean, it's very long. I'm just going to read a section 65 through 72. And it says this, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Isn't that often how things go? As when life is good, that's when we drift. And then when things happen, that's kind of what gives us a kick in the pants and we turn back to God. Stop doing things on our own. That's what he's saying. Uh, he says, I, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease. That sounds like he's in Texas somewhere. But I delight in your law. It's good for me. Now, this is, this is the place you end up. You do not start here. I know a lot of you know that. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Why? That I may learn your statutes, that I may learn your truth. It becomes real to you. A lot of these psalms, like I said last time, became very real to me because I was finally in those situations. And then verse 72, The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. So this is basically it for the Christian. Trials and suffering, those things are all by the hand of God, no matter what it is, good or bad. All trials are by the hand of God and they're designed to make you and I more like His Son. And so often they're not fun, but that's what He's doing. 1 John 3.2 I'm going to read you a few verses that talk about this. 1 John 3.2 Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him for we shall see Him as He is. That's the end goal of salvation. It's, it's not even so you and I can be forgiven and go to heaven. The main point of this is so God can have a bunch of His sons, a bunch of His perfect Christs in His kingdom. We're all being made like Him, being made into Him. When He returns, we'll have a body like Him. But this is the point of all this. And I want to show you this. Why is affliction good? So that the, the psalm writer here tells us two different reasons why affliction is good. Uh, verse 67, he, he, he said again, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So it's to help me follow the word of God. Verse 71, it's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So it's all about learning more about God and His word. So uh, that's one of the main points here is whatever trial you find yourself in, it's so easy to be uh, you know, so, so concentrated on what's happening to you and how bad it is and how, uh, how little fun you're having that we can often miss what God's trying to accomplish in it. Right? And so even if, you know, whatever trial you're going through, do all you can. Pray about it. Do the best that you can possibly through the power of the Spirit to keep your mind focused and looking for what is God trying to do in me while I'm dealing with this valley. Because He has put me there. You notice what He says here in the psalm? Verse 75, we didn't read it, now we are. So a, little, a few verses later, I know, O Lord, that Your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness, who afflicted me? You did. But notice how God afflicts His people, how He brings trouble, how He brings suffering to your life in faithfulness. He's not going to abandon you. He's not doing this to hurt you. He's not doing this out of evil. 
He's doing this out of faithfulness, out of love, to make you more like His Son. The Son had to suffer. So, a lot of times to accomplish that, we have to suffer. And I'll tell you this, the main thing that I've learned in my life, I told you all last week, I'll tell you again. One thing that was sorely lacking in mine was a, was a dedicated prayer life, and a deep prayer life. I know how to pray, but I didn't really know how to pray. And God had to build that in me through taking a lot of things away for a time. So that's what this is about. If you're, um, if you're still taking notes here, I guess I didn't put it in your note page, but um, I'll say it a couple times. Affliction for the Christian is good because of the source, which is God. So I'll say it again. Uh, one thing you learn from this psalm is affliction for the Christian is good because of the source, which is God. Does anybody need me to repeat that? Affliction for the Christian is good because of the source, which is God. So when you're afflicted, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to have all the different feelings that come with it. You're going to because you're human. But don't forget, for some reason, God has brought this along. And there's something He's going to teach me through it. Even if someone else who is in sin is sinning against me and it's brought this stuff on, God's still in control of that. He's still going to teach you something through it. Even through the mistakes of others. That gives you hope. Uh, one more, James 1, 2 through 5. This is a New Testament example of w- that this is why this happens. Uh, my brethren, or it's verse 4, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So there's, there's the main point of trials is to teach us uh, faith and to teach us patience as Christians. But also, don't, you know, don't read too far past or too quickly past verse 4. Let patience have its perfect work. Let the, let, let the struggle, let the suffering, let the trial you know, play out. Let it run its course. And it's not that you're made perfect. It's let patience have its perfect work. Let it be completed. I mean, so how often? I prayed it. As soon as all this started happening and I knew something was wrong, I was asking God to stop this. And here we are almost two months later and now I'm getting to the end of it. I guarantee you, I didn't pray, God, I can handle this for about two months. No, I guarantee you, I did not pray that. And you don't either. But that's something that we have to remind ourselves of. Is that it's from God. My salvation is secure. I know He loves me. It's done out of faithfulness. So God, as hard as this is to remind myself and to pray, let this play out. Show me what you're going to show me and do what you're going to do. Don't stop it until you have to. But I'd like you to stop it quick. Just keep that in mind. Going back to verse 65, and then I'll go to the next lesson. He says, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. So all this is according to the word of God. He tells us he's going to do this. He doesn't hide it from us. And the psalm writer, even in his struggle, you've dealt well with me. Again, you may not get there till it's over, but that's the lesson. As God deals well with His people, even in struggle, He's teaching us and growing us. Number three, the rest of these are a little bit shorter. <clears throat> so God hears us, but He may not respond quickly. Come on, preacher. Can't you find a verse that says He responds immediately? He's going to respond on His time. And I bet you know as well as I do, nine times out of ten, He's going to respond slow. Because we don't learn the lessons we need to learn when things are fast. So God hears us, but He may not, and He often does not respond quickly. You see that in lots of verses, lots of stories. But I'll just go to Psalm 120, verses 1 and 2. In my distress, I cried to the Lord and He heard me. So he's prayed, he's heard, he knows God hears him. But then it's, 
He, he didn't say it's over. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. These ongoing things he keeps praying about. Lord, I've prayed. I know you've heard. The problem's still going on. We just have to know he hears. Psalm 121, you read the next chapter, it says the very same thing that you know, our, our help comes from God. Just remember that. But it may not be quick. There's, there's lessons to learn. Number four, in times of trial, pray regularly and expectantly. Pray regularly and expectantly in times of trial. The expectantly stuff is sometimes or sometimes is the hardest thing for me. Because when you're having to, when you're praying, first off, you're relying on God because you know at this point I don't have any answers and I can't fix this. So you start praying. But when we pray, do we pray actually expecting God to do something? If I'm honest, I don't always pray that way. I pray to get it out there, and I might pray hoping God does something, but I don't know if I always necessarily, especially if it's a big thing, or after so long of suffering and no answered prayer yet, you kind of get to where you might still pray about it, but I don't really expect much from God. He says, keep praying and keep expecting. Expect something to happen. And I want to show you a psalm that teaches that. Psalm 123, 1 and 2. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until He has mercy on us. And he uses these, you know, these Old Testament pictures. A uh, servant and a maid, they're watching their master's hands. So, and that was what would happen is, uh, is the wealthy people would have their servants. And the servants, if they didn't have anything to do in the moment, they didn't have a direct order, they would, they would watch the master. They'd watch their boss. They'd watch their leader. And there'd be a motion. Okay, go do this. Or, hey, I have something for you. And so they're watching the hand of the master. And they, they're, they're constantly watching it waiting for their orders or waiting for a summons. And so he uses that example. For, for, it's, it's no accident. That's how you and I are to pray. It's as you and I are praying and waiting. It's like we're watching the hand of God waiting for Him to act. And it's like for the servant. The servant knew that the master was going to act eventually. Because there's still work to be done. There's still things to do. And the servant still had to, or the master still had to provide. In the same way, Christian, pray to God, watch Him, and expect. Because eventually, He's going to motion with the hand and something's going to happen. Isaiah 26.3 I believe I put it. I did. You will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because He trusts in you. Now I can tell you in my experience, I mean... I, I knew that verse. I know Philippians 4.8. I know all these verses that talk about you know, how you keep a peaceful mind, but sometimes when, when chemically things go off, you don't have a whole lot of control. But I can tell you this, in, in, times of, in times of trial, in times of stress, in times of anxiety, in times of depression, in all those things, in times of stress, we, we get that way when our mind is off God. And I had, you know, some of the worst times came from my mind had gotten off of my hope in God and all I could think about was myself and the issue I was facing. And that's when it just it just tail spins. But he says very clear, you keep him in perfect or complete peace whose mind is what? Stays on you. When our mind gets off, that's when we get into trouble. Number five, this is the last one. Use affliction as a test of faith. Believers are going to remain. False converts are going to quit. This is actually, it was a really bizarre lesson for me to learn, but it was one of the most encouraging. As I discovered, and I would give all credit to the Holy Spirit, if you're truly saved, you're not going to abandon the faith, no matter how bad things get. 
Scripture tells us when people do abandon the faith, like totally swear it off, I don't believe I'm done with this, especially in times of trial, they never were a believer. This is called a conversion. You know, you're not born again. You're not converted and then somehow reverse that. It's an act of God. So if you're truly a believer, no matter what happens, your faith may be shaken, but it never breaks. It never disappears. And so in a weird way, when you're going through a trial and you find your faith growing stronger, that should be like an aha. This is a genuine proof that I'm really saved. I'm not a phony. Because like I mentioned uh, last week, I think I did. Um, you know, I've had to deal with all of her stuff and help her through challenges, but I've never been hit before. And now I have. And I always kind of wondered, you know, God, how would I respond if I went to the doctor, found out I had stage 4 cancer and it was inoperable? Or God, how would I respond if if something happened to me and I I got paralyzed and I was in a wheelchair, you know, something that other people have had to deal with and walk through that I haven't. How would I really respond, God? Because I can preach it and I can say it, but until I've been there, I just don't know. I'm very thankful to God that now I know. I can stand before you and honestly say, I'm not a phony and it's not because of me. It's because of the Holy Spirit and what He's done. My faith should have broken if I was lost, and it didn't. I don't tell you that to look at me and say, oh, what a wonderful man. No. It's so when you go through something, view it from this perspective. How's my faith through this trial? Is it maintained? Is it strengthened? Congratulations. That's a genuine proof that all this is for real. And then like what David talked about this morning, when Jesus shows up, you're ready. My faith's real. I've been given every reason to not believe, and I still believe somehow. So, use that as encouragement. I want to read a couple of verses, and I'm going to pray. 1 John 2.19 And this is just one genuine proof. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be able, or they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. They're just talking about people that were in the church, and the wave of persecution came, trouble came. Uh, hey, where, where's so and so? I hadn't seen them in a while. That was happening back then. People who quit and who stay quit were never truly believers. Sometimes we stray. And maybe at some point, all of us at some point in our lives have strayed. But you never stay that way. A true believer comes back, stays a part of this, maintains faith. Someone who genuinely quits and turns their back was never a believer. So if you stay, you maintain faith, that's a good sign. Uh, Hebrews 3.14 For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Again, you get the end there, you reach the end of your life and you've maintained faith all the way through. There's a good sign that you're saved. Because this life has it gives us many reasons to quit. It gives us many reasons not to believe. But you die believing, well, that's a good sign. And I don't know if this is helpful at all, but I know some people sometimes struggle uh, with with loved ones who were believers and then uh, they may develop Alzheimer's or dementia and then that person's not who they were and they don't even act like a believer. Don't worry about them. That's just a product of the fall. If someone's genuinely a believer but they lose their mind and they don't act like it anymore, they could even swear off that they don't believe it. If they're genuinely saved, God doesn't save the brain. He saves the soul. No, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. They continue to the end. First uh, Peter one six through seven is the last verse. <clears throat> or no, I got one more. Sorry, Philippians. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, 
may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> That's the point of trials right there. To test the genuineness of your faith. So when they come, that's what it's about. It's to make you more like Christ and to demonstrate to you whether or not your faith is in the right place. Simple as that. And so here we go. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Again, if you're a true believer, it's not just all on you where you look at these tests and see if you're genuine, if Jesus has truly saved you, He's going to finish His work. He never stops working. So you can't even walk away from this faith if it's genuinely been started. He keeps you there because He's got work to do. Our faith is in Him. Our hope is in Him. kind of takes me back to point number one. When you find yourself in this valley, remember your salvation and remember that God's working. So that's all I have for part two. Next time, uh, we'll get into some of the prophets and we'll look at what Ezekiel talks about. He gets pretty serious uh, with some of his stuff and I'll share more there. So thank you all for being here tonight. And you all stay warm. And let me, uh, let me pray for you real quick. God, I just thank you for a, a good day of worship. And Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful Lindsay and I were able to be here this morning with our church family. And, and God, I'm... I'm thankful that you, you answered my prayer and gave me peace. I wasn't sure how I would feel. Uh, you've, been, you've been very good. And Father, I pray that you'd bless everyone who's, been a, who's a part of this church, uh, but especially those who have taken time out of their busy lives to, to reach out to Lindsay and I, uh, those who have made meals for us, those who have prayed for us. Uh, they they'll never know how encouraging that was. And Father, I just pray that you'd use this. I pray that you'd not, you know, I pray that you'd not only use my trials to help others, but uh, help us all to be that way. If we uh, go through something, help us to understand that you've taken us through it. And once we make it through, we've got, we've got some things to teach others now. We're able to, he to, to help others. And help us to be brave enough to do that. Father, there's a couple more, you know, if it's your will, there's a couple more Sunday mornings left where uh, you'll have Brother David preaching, and I just pray that you'd strengthen him, give him the words that you would, you'd have to say. And we're so thankful for what you've given him to this point, and we look forward to, the, to these next couple messages. But Father, use him, bless him, and please bless our church. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.